Okay, it says we are live, so that's good. We're here is pretty much the way that I would I would answer it. Um, there's a difference between a discrepancy and action. Now, um, if I walked into a room and there were three people in there, and it was um, Bill, Joe, and Kathy, and I wrote about it later, and I walked or I that. I wrote about what happened later, and I said, yeah, I walked into the room, and I noticed that Bill and Joe were in there. But then I write, write about it again later, and I say, I noticed that Bill, Joe, and Kathy were there. Now, those are not contradictions of one another, because Bill and Joe were in there. I just didn't happen to mention Kathy. And so, if the rooster crowed three times, it also crowed twice. And so, what's what's emphasized um, in Mark's account um, is not the, the three... Uh, crows, not the three um, times the rooster crowed, but um, the the three denials. So if the ro if the rooster crowed um, three times, it also crowed twice. So to say it crowed twice, uh, it's not a contradiction. It's complementary uh, to the idea that he that um, the rooster crowed three times because if he crowed three times, he also crowed two times. Now. Uh, pe people have said that if there's any discrepancy at all in the Gospels when they record something, those are contradictions. Well, no, they're, they're not contradictions. Uh, they're complementary uh, to one another. They're simply uh, emphasizing. Uh, they're complementary uh, to one another. They're simply uh, emphasizing uh, different aspects of the different uh, narratives. Uh, like the, the, um, the men that came out of the tombs in the region of, of Gadara, the, the Gadarene demoniacs. Um, one account has two men coming out from the tombs. The other one has one. Well, the, the, the one account is emphasizing the one. The other is emphasizing both of them. If, if two of them came out, then you would definitely, you would rightly be able to say that one of them came out because he did. So just because you don't give every detail of a story doesn't mean that you're telling a different story. It means you're emphasizing something else, uh, em emphasizing different details. Uh, people do, do have the same questions about uh, the resurrection accounts. Uh, in the Gospels, and they wonder, you know, who went to the tomb, and what time was it, and how many went there, and when did the angels get there? And the thing is, that they aren't contradictory uh, to each other. There's there's easy ways to harmonize the accounts. The the different accounts are emphasizing uh, different things that that happened. Because your story emphasizes different details, does not mean um, that those uh, stories are contradictory. They're they're easily harmonizable. So. So that's how I would answer that. If the rooster crowed three times, he most certainly crowed twice, and you would rightly be able to say he crowed twice without um, mentioning every single time that, that it crowed. So that's a that's a good question. It's a good way of emphasizing the difference between um, discrepancies and contradictions. And please please know that when, when you're in seminary, also if you're if you get into um, biblical study um, in great and try to do it in great detail, you're gonna you're gonna see biblical critics emphasizing every time there's a difference uh, between any of the narratives in the synoptic gospels in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Although those are contradictions, and you think they're they're not contradictions, okay? They they are in perfect harmony. They're just emphasizing different details. Okay, just because uh, I mentioned, okay, if someone came into my office right here, they could say, wow, I saw he had the Reformation commentary on scripture in there. And someone else says, yeah, he also had um, Herman Bovink's four volume of Reformed Dogmatics. Oh, that's a contradiction. No, they just didn't notice the same books. Bo both sets of books are in here, but that person noticed this and that person noticed that. Um, if one person said he has, he has six kids, well, actually I actually have 10. But yeah, but that picture only has six. Well, that was before the last four were born on the wall over here on my on my wall of pictures. Now, is it true that there's a picture in here that I, I had six kids or I have six kids? Yeah, that's not contradictory uh, to the fact that there's actually more than that. So, so there, so that's that. Okay, I um, I didn't get any more questions. Um, I need to try to figure out some way of. Uh, of uh, encouraging people to, to write in questions if they have any questions of any kind. But I do have several things queued up here that I wanted to, um, to play. Um, I listen I, I listen almost every day to a podcast called The World and Everything in It, which is pretty good. Um, Christian journalism, you know, Christian uh, uh, worldview podcast. And I, I marked a couple of timestamps. I actually wrote them down here. I did a test recording of this earlier today and it worked pretty well. So I think, I think it should pick up the, uh, the sound fairly well here, but, um, with all of the violence and all the rioting and, you know, the, every time, 
Uh, you know, it, it, it's always heartbreaking. Any anyone, no matter what color they are, that gets shot and killed by someone, it's always very sad um, when that sort of thing happens. But the way that the church um, should be responding to this um, very often is not a good thing. And so I want to emphasize to you um, several things from, from a couple of these clips. I want to play a couple of clips for you here from the world and everything in it. And this is a free podcast. I'll, I, I might put a link to this in the description notes here. In fact, I'll put it in the I'll put it in the uh, the chat here just so people can see it. Um, okay. Oh, Jesse's got a question. Okay, Jesse, I'll get I'll get to your uh, question here in a in a little bit. Um, but let me uh, actually let, let me go ahead and answer your question. The Bible says all will give an account before God. Since we are justified by Christ and have his imputed righteousness, will we still have the sorrow of listening to every sin we committed? Uh, no, I don't believe so. No, I don't believe so. Um, there is there is a judgment of works for reward, um, and that's really what those uh, judgment passages are emphasizing. It's, it's ironic that those passages are used so often by false teachers to emphasize um, that, you know, whether or not you're going to get into heaven is uncertain. Well, that's clearly not what they're talking about. The doctrine of justification um, speaks to that directly. We are declared righteous once for all. There is no condemnation. Uh, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It's not that no charge of wrongdoing will be, brought, will be brought against me. But God is so gracious and so loving and so kind that he is even pleased to reward that which is sincere that I did in my life as a Christian, even though it was accompanied by all sorts of uh, ill motives and, and wrong um things behind it in my heart and my motives and my, in my life. And it was soiled with many imperfections and impurities and everything else. He is pleased to reward even that, um, that which is sincere, although it falls short of his glory. There's only one righteousness that can satisfy the, the judgment of almighty God and his holiness. And that is the gift of righteousness that was achieved by Christ and given to us by faith alone. So, um, so yes, that, um, that doesn't mean that we're going to sit there and listen to all of our sins being recounted. Our sins uh, were nailed to the cross and we bear them no more. Okay. So good. Very good question. Um, all right. Let me move into, this is the world and everything in it. This is the, the uh, podcast um, for today. So September 3rd, 2020. And the title of this podcast is Christians call for justice, unrest in Belarus and hope awards. And again, this is the world and everything in it. The podcast, it's like a daily news pop feed. And I listen to it almost every day. It's about a half hour long. Um, and there's good stuff in it. That it's not just about news. They also give um, encouraging news from time to time, which is always a good thing since the outlets tend not to do that ever. So listen to this. I'm going to make a number of comments here. The, the way that um, that uh, Christians are reacting to the racial hatred and the injustice issues and social justice has been pretty discouraging, I'll tell you, uh, for the most part. But here, here's a, an interview, a clip where a pastor is talking about uh, what we need to be doing to try to, to help overthrow these social issues. So, so take a listen to this. I am prayerful and hopeful that this movement will capture the imagination of evangelicals and Christians of every stripe so that the kingdom of God and the justice of God could be established in our hearts. That's my prayer. As one uh, rabbi said, if not now, when? And if not us, who? As one rabbi said, did you hear that? I was uh, uh, driving, uh, uh, listening this morning to this, and I was like, what did he just say? So rabbis from synagogues are involved in this coming together as fellow believers uh, to try to combat this stuff and listen to a little bit more. <laughs> Reporting for World, I'm Katie Galtney. Additional support comes from... Okay, that was, that was kind of the end of that one. Let, let me... There was one other uh, quote I wanted you to hear. Um, in 1924. Okay, listen to this. I'll back up just a little bit here. Others. Listen. Amid the increasing tension, churches are drawing together. After the initial crackdown, evangelical pastors issued a joint statement condemning violence. They called the nation's 70,000 evangelical Christians to daily prayer for a peaceful resolution. <laughs> Pastor Leonid Mikovic is a leader of the Baptist Union of Belarus. Okay, so the, the, this fellow is the leader of the Baptist Union in Belarus. And he's, so he's a Baptist. This is a Baptist minister. So this is an evangelical type, someone who should be a Protestant committed to the gospel and things like that. Now listen to what he says. 
even two days ago we prayed with other churches, Orthodox, Catholic, um, Baptist, Pentecostal, Charismatics, uh, Jews. So they're calling upon folks to pray together, Catholic, Orthodox, Baptist, Pentecostal, and Jews. Um, that reminds me of uh, Bill Bright, uh, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, when he said in a book, um, if synagogues and churches would come together and pray, then God would heal, would hear from heaven and heal our land and everything else. I remember thinking, synagogues? Um, I thought we needed a mediator to, to be between us and God the Father to be able to pray um, and to reconcile us to God and to justify us before him by his cross. So bizarre. Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic are getting together with this Baptist minister, and, and he's also got Jews coming together. Now, what does that tell you about what the basis of this unity is? Every time the, the church tries to do this, tries to unite around social causes, you just throw doctrine out the window. You throw the teaching out the window. You throw the very thing that makes us Christians out the window. And it's utterly tragic to, to see how, how frequently this is done. Listen to what he goes on to say. We met in Central Cathedral in Minsk, Catholic Cathedral. Okay, they met at a, at a central uh, location at a Catholic Cathedral in Minsk. And I prayed there and some other brothers and sisters. It's, it's maybe first time in our history. Of Nikovich says church unity yeah. is one positive thing coming from this time of turmoil. Church unity is one positive thing coming from this time of turmoil. So Catholic, Orthodox, Baptist, and um, Jews are coming together. And so th th this is being called church unity. H how is this unity when it's not based on the only basis for unity that exists, which is the gospel? Another is the opportunity churches have to help those injured in the violence. We trust our Lord and we uh, try to help people in many ways as uh, we have some resources, some opportunities to do it. That's our mission now. As far as help from the international Christian community, Mikovic says the best thing now is to pray for peace in the streets and unity in the churches. We would ask you to pray for peace for our people. So pray for peace on the streets and unity in the churches. But did you notice who was listed there in the churches? Um, Orthodox, Catholic, Pentecostal, um, Evangelical, and Jews. And I'm just, I'm starting to feel more and more lonely in my convictions. <laughs> you know, there was a guy I met in Akron, Ohio, long ago, uh, when I first started going to Presbyterian churches and uh, this guy said, yeah, there was a time in my life I thought it was basically me and Charles Spurgeon were the only two like people that actually believed the true gospel in the world. And then I finally found some people that, that, that really love the gospel and are willing to, to preach it and stand for it against all this ecumenical schmooze. But l let me just define that word. What does ecumenical mean? It means basically throwing aside um, your doctrinal differences for the sake of uniting around social causes and justice and things like that. And it's always, it's always unhealthy to do that. Now, as citizens of our community, certainly there can be a co-belligerency and people can, in a sense, work together. But the fact of the matter is, unless the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is justification by faith alone, unless that is the rallying cry, forget social justice, you're never going to achieve it. Because if you don't have the true gospel, you're not going to have people um, in their hearts being renewed by the Holy Spirit, and none of these things are ever going to come to pass. Okay, so I was I was a little bit disconcerted by uh, some of those uh, comments that were made by by folks, and I, I really was, was concerned. Once all the rioting and everything started, and once all the unrest started happening, especially in America. And I know it's, it's not just here, but it's all over the place that there's all sorts of stuff going. People are always shooting at each other about something, but the racial violence and everything else, you, you can just know, you know, for sure that people are going to throw aside doctrine in the name of these social causes. And that's been done repeatedly uh, by the church in America uh, to devastating, devastating consequences. So, 
I want to point out several things here um, while we're on this topic of, of ecumenical activity. It's one thing I've noticed um, when I was more involved in pro-life work when I, li when I lived in Ohio. Uh, the Catholic crowd could could not have cared less what you believed, as long as, long as you weren't like a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness. They didn't care. If you were Catholic, Protestant, Eastern Orthodox, whatever, you were fine. You were a Christian. And they wanted to get together and pray and, and do all sorts of stuff like that with Father, this person and that person and everything else. And over and over again, I had to tell people I wasn't going to do that and eventually had to send out an email uh, to everybody and just let them know, you know, you just need to take me off these lists. You guys do not understand the Christian faith um, the way that I do and what I would maintain the way that the Bible does. Because justification by faith alone is the gospel. And if you don't affirm that, uh, you're not a Christian. Okay, now, we're not saying that justification is by affirming the doctrine. But we are saying that your confidence needs to be in Christ alone. However else you may articulate it, you need to be trusting only in Jesus to get you into heaven to be a Christian. Now, what about Eastern Orthodoxy? What about uh, Roman Catholicism? I wanted to, to point out something. I haven't read this whole book yet, um, but what I have read in it is absolutely fascinating. It's called The Protestant Patriarch. Protestant Patriarch, The Life of Cyril Lucaris. Okay, Patriarch of Constantinople in the Eastern Orthodox religion. Okay, and his dates are 1572 to 1638. So he's right on the, the heels of the Reformation. Okay, and eventually, to, to make a long story short, this guy eventually becomes a Calvinist. He becomes a reformed Christian while he's Patriarch of Constantinople. And he actually published a creed, um, a confession of faith. And chapter 13 of Cyril Lucaris, the, the Patriarch of Constantinople, the head of the Eastern Orthodox Church, published a creed in 1629. Okay, let, let me, before I read the, the article here, I want to read the doctrinal uh, the chapter of this confession that he wrote, this Orthodox prelate wrote, I wanted to uh, read to you um, an article. Let's see, a, a paragraph of an article. Yeah, I had pulled up right here. Yeah, here we go. <clears throat> uh, let's see, where was the quotation? Yeah, here we go. In 1629, Cyril Lucaris, Patriarch of Constantinople, published his famous Confession of Orthodox Faith in Geneva. As far as possible, it accommodated the language and creeds of the Orthodox Church. It appeared in the same year, two Latin editions, four French and one German and one English. The publication of the Confession shocked many leaders in the Orthodox Church and stirred up a storm of controversy. In 18 articles, followed by four questions and their answers, Lucaris professed virtually all the major doctrines of Calvinism, predestination, justification by faith alone, acceptance of only two sacraments, rejection of icons, Rejection of the infallibility of the church. Lucaris frankly embraced the doctrine of predestination. He asserted, quote, We believe that the most merciful God hath predestinated his elect unto glory before the beginning of the world without any respect under their works, and that there was no other impulsive cause to this election but only the goodwill and mercy of God, end quote. Wow. You know why Lucaris did all this? Because he started reading his Bible. He started reading the Bible. When you read the Bible, you tend to move in that direction. Listen to what, listen to what this article goes on to say. But Lucaris stressed the importance of works, not as the basis for the salvation of man, but as proof and fruit thereof. <laughs> yep. When you read the Bible, you will get it right. Okay. Works are not the cause of salvation. They are simply the fruit and evidence thereof. And Cyril Lucaris in the early 17th century, reading his Bible, figured that out. And in his correspondence with Geneva and the Reformed theologians um, on the in uh, Europe, he understood the Christian faith, and he tried to codify that into a confession. Listen to this. <clears throat> Chapter 13 of Cyril Lucaris, Patriarch of Constantinople, of his confession, quote, We believe that man is justified by faith and not by works. But when we say by faith... We understand the correlative or object of faith, which is the righteousness of Christ, which, as if by hand, faith apprehends and applies unto us for our salvation. This we say without any prejudice to good works. For truth itself teaches us that works must not be neglected, that they are necessary means to testify to our faith and confirm our calling. 
but that works are sufficient for our salvation, that they can enable one to appear before the tribunal of Christ, and that of their own merit they can confer salvation. Human frailty witnesses to be false. But the righteousness of Christ being applied to the penitent alone justifies and saves the faithful. Wow. Why did he get this right? He, he cracked open his Bible. He started reading it. And he started corresponding with good theologians. The Protestant Patriarch <laughs> is the book. I really need to finish that book. What I have read in it is absolutely fascinating. Fascinating person. Now, so Cyril... Cyril Lucaris, Patriarch of Constantinople in the Eastern Orthodox faith, he publishes this creed uh, defending biblical truth. And later, the Eastern Orthodox religion convoked uh, a, a, a council, a synod of Eastern Orthodox churches was called in Jerusalem in 1672 to refute the position of Cyril Lucaris, Patriarch of Constantinople, who had published a confession in which he attempted to express Orthodox beliefs in terms of the predestination beliefs of Calvinism. <laughs> so here, here's the, here are the decrees of Eastern Orthodoxy. Listen carefully to this. If you're wondering, you know, what is, is Eastern Orthodoxy? Orthodoxy or, you know, can they, is there a way to understand them as being uh, true to the biblical faith? No, there's not. Listen to decree number 13. We believe a man to be not simply justified through faith alone, but through faith with, which works through love. That is to say, through faith and works. Paul says it's by faith, not by works. They say faith and works. Paul says it's by faith apart from works. And they say faith and works. So, and of course, it contains all the necessary affirmations of grace. Great, You couldn't do it without grace. Couldn't do it without grace. But man's works are what justify him before God. And so there you have orthodoxy. So what about this uh, Baptist minister in Belarus uh, who's saying that, you know, pray for unity in the churches, that we all pray against all this violence going on. If you're not united by the gospel, you're not united at all. If you're not united by, by the one true gospel, you don't have unity at all. So there's that. There's the, um, the Protestant patriarch, Cyril Lucaris, uh, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy there. And also, uh, just wanted to remind people um, of what the Roman Catholic religion teaches about justification. This is from chapter 7 of session 6. What the justification of the impious is and what are the causes thereof. This disposition or preparation is followed by justification itself, which is not remission of sins merely, but also the sanctification and renewal of the inward man. So in Roman Catholicism, what is justification? Justification is making you a more moral person. Justification is the renewal and sanctification of the inward man. Biblically, that's not true. Biblically, that is a false gospel. Justification does not change us inwardly. It changes only our legal status before the law of God because it's based solely upon the imputation of Christ's righteousness to our account by faith alone. So there you have the Roman Catholic false gospel of justification by faith and works. Uh, justification is sanctification in Catholicism. And in um, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, we are justified by faith and works. And biblically, that's not the case. Our works can never justify us because of the disproportion between them and God makes a justification before God by our works or getting into heaven by our works an absolute, total, and complete impossibility okay uh checking my email here i do not see any more questions um i've actually got my my phone on airplane mode here well there's oh yeah, man this is like this is a low point uh, very few people only three uh, are watching um so we're at the 25 minute mark um if no one else has any questions or comments um going once going twice I'm um, going to go ahead and uh, cut it off. We'll just do a short program today. I've got still got a lot of work to do on uh, my sermon for Sunday, which, by the way, we're baptizing two people upon their profession of faith um, and are receiving four more um, into the church, one by transfer and three covenant children that have made their professions of faith. And so we're taking the Lord's Supper, doing baptisms, and hearing the professions of faith of, of others. So what a glorious Sunday it's going to be. I can't wait. It's going to be a, an awesome, awesome time, and God is so good to us. So anyway, uh, to my huge audience Three people, 
Thank you for watching. And to those on Summer Audio, thank you for listening.